You're listening to The Jacob Vaught Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Vaught. Here he is. Jacob Ball. Sports fans, welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am Jacob Volk, and I have to start with that crazy game yesterday. That was Chiefs-Ravens. Patrick Mahomes putting on a clinic. Slicing and dicing the Ravens defense. I mean, he did things yesterday that I didn't think were possible against an NFL defense. And this isn't just any NFL defense. This is the Ravens defense. A good defense. A team that had only given up 22 points its previous two games. Mahomes destroyed them. I mean, that crazy jump fake, and then he goes in the opposite direction and throws it. It's crazy. The shovel pass to Anthony Sherman. Mahomes was just having fun. How about Eric Fisher getting involved? Catching a touchdown pass from Mahomes. That's a moment he's going to save her forever. Mahomes was putting balls in the absolutely perfect spot. And you heard it on the broadcast yesterday. There was nothing more that those Ravens defenders could have done. And you know what? They were right. This is Patrick Mahomes' world. We're just living in it. And I will say, I don't mind the new Monday Night Football booth. I like Steve Levy, local kid. I've never heard Clyde Edwards Hilaire's name pronounced that way. He was pronouncing it Hilaire. I don't think that's correct. The biggest knock I've heard on him is that he doesn't have a big game voice. What exactly is a big game voice? I've never heard that term before. You know, Levy's a guy who worked his way up the ranks at ESPN. Yeah, he was on the garbage shifts of SportsCenter. And yeah, he was calling... The non-marquee college football games. If that's how you associate him, okay. I'm sure I could find someone that still associates John Sterling with hockey. Or Susan Waldman with WFAN updates. What exactly is a big game voice? I like Levy. I don't think he's done a bad job. I like Brian Greasy. I think he's solid. I think he's getting overshadowed by Lewis Riddick. I think Riddick is smarter than Greasy. But I actually think the two of them complement each other really well. Riddick brings that defensive side of it since he was a former uh, safety. And Brian Greasy was obviously a former quarterback. So the two of them do complement each other well. I just think Riddick is smarter than Greasy. And I love Riddick. I wouldn't be surprised if he got an NFL GM job this offseason. There are rumblings that he could end up with the Giants if and when they move on from Gettleman. I think that would be a great move for the Giants. But you know what? That's not the issue with the game that we saw yesterday. And neither is Mahomes. 
it's Lamar Jackson really not playing well. In fact, he played like garbage. Completed just over 50% of his passes. Threw for less than 100 yards. He fumbled twice. He turned it over once. You know, this is starting to be a trend with Jackson. He folds under the bright lights. At the end of the day, when you're an NFL quarterback, you can't do that. And this is a guy who thrived under the bright lights in Louisville. But in his first playoff game, he laid an egg. His second playoff game, he laid an egg. And now Monday Night Football, the battle of the MVPs, the entire football world watching, that's the performance he puts out there? That doesn't work for me. This is looking like a disturbing trend for Jackson. That he can't win marquee games. I'm not saying I'm giving up on him. I like Lamar Jackson. I like him a lot. I have him on one of my fantasy teams. And yes, his no-show yesterday did cost me that matchup. And Devin Duvernay cost me another matchup. Him and Russell Wilson. That was my keeper league. I really should have won this week in my keeper league. I'm ticked off about that. I really am. I'm not ticked off at my opponent. not ticked off at... You know, the commissioner or anything like that. I just really should have won. Only reason that guy won was because he started Russell Wilson. And Wilson threw five touchdowns. And he had the Ravens defense. Duvernay recording the kickoff return touchdown. That counts for the defense. Man, that ticked me off. But the bottom line is, Lamar Jackson is going to have to learn... How to win games when the lights are on bright. He's going to have to learn how to win games when he's not in the most optimal of conditions. He can turn it around. He's only 23 years old. This is his third year in the NFL. He's not a bust by any stretch. But... It has to concern you a little bit if you're a Ravens fan that with the lights on bright, he folds like a cheap suit. And he looks like a running back. If he wants to be taken seriously as a quarterback, he's going to have to use his arm to win big games. Moving on now to the Stanley Cup Finals. And the NHL did it. They staged a successful playoffs in two bubbles, then turning into one. Toronto and Edmonton, then just Edmonton. And we have new Stanley Cup champions in the Tampa Bay Lightning. I told you the Lightning were going to win yesterday. I told you the Stars wouldn't come back from 3-1 down. Believe it or not, I actually know a little bit about sports. I will say, though, one thing that I didn't see coming, the stars really looked dead to the world in the first two periods of this game. They only had one shot on goal for most of the first period. They had eight shots on goal after two periods. The Lightning were thoroughly outplaying the Stars. Then the third period, they decided that they actually wanted to try to win this thing. But it was too little too late. You're not going to beat this Lightning team in one period. I can't even say that Andre Vasilevsky stood on his head. How many great saves did he make? I mean, he did withstand a pretty good onslaught. In the third period. And he did make a toe save that if the puck had gone in, it would have been goalie interference. I'm not saying Vasilevsky played bad, but it wasn't the best game I've ever seen Vasilevsky play. 
He gets full credit for pitching a shutout in a Stanley Cup clinching game. And it is hard when you're barely tested throughout the first two periods to then withstand an onslaught of shots. But it wasn't the most dominant performance I've ever seen from Vasilevsky. The stars really looked lifeless out there. I don't know if the back-to-back overtime games on back-to-back nights took a lot out of them. That's probably what it was. But you know what? The Lightning were able to withstand it. Why weren't the Stars? The Lightning were the better team all throughout this series. And realistically, all throughout the playoffs. They did a great job against the Blue Jackets, winning the quintuple overtime classic. They beat a really good Bruins team in five games. One game, they beat them 7-1. to one. They outclassed the Islanders, and they outclassed the Stars. They are a really talented team. And they did this without their best player, Steven Stamkos. Only played one game in these playoffs. And it was really nice that he got the first chance to touch the cup. Very classy move by the Lightning and Commissioner Bettman. And speaking of Bettman, him and Donald Fear, the league and the NHLPA, deserve a ton of credit for actually getting this thing done. I know when I first heard about it, I was skeptical. But the league pushed through it. And they got it done. Also, I just want to squash this right now. There is no asterisk on this Stanley Cup. I've seen some people say that. No, 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 no. The way the NHL did the return to play... That negated any asterisk. More to the point, the two teams in the Stanley Cup Finals, Lightning and Stars, were definitely playoff teams. Yes, the Stars were slumping at the time of the pause, but they were still in a pretty good position to make the playoffs. Could they have fallen out? I guess. Anything's possible. But I don't think that was ever a real possibility. So no, there's no asterisk on this win. Is it the most difficult Stanley Cup that's ever been won? You can make that argument. You go through the pause, then you go through the bubble, which the players did not like. There have been a bunch of players that have said, hey, we're not doing this again. Or at least we really don't want to. We have to find a way to do this differently. I mean, it's tough. You're away from your family for months. And you can't leave. You're stuck in that one building. Or in the case of the NBA, just a certain area of Disney. It's not easy what we ask these players to do, but they did it. Give them credit. They may not have liked it, but they did it. And I will say about the Conn Smythe winner, Victor Hedman, congrats to him. I know why he won it. Dominated defensively. Extremely impactful for the Lightning. Did things offensively that very few defensemen would be able to do. I mean, you've got Paul Coffey, Bobby Orr, Dennis Potvin. Who else? Nick Lidstrom? I'm not talking about actual stats. I'm just talking about using a noodle and the eye test. Watching Hedman. How many players could do what he was put out on the ice to do? It's a very short list. You know, I get all that. But 
I really didn't think he deserved the Conn Smythe Trophy. I'd have liked it to have gone to Braden Point. Vasilevsky would have made sense. Nikita Kucherov would have made sense. Those guys were on the first rung of the ladder. Hedman was on the second rung. I'm not trying to rain on his parade or anything. He had a great playoffs. But I just don't think he deserved the Conn Smythe Trophy as much as Point, Vasilevsky, and Kucherov did in that order. But look, congrats to the Lightning. They had a great playoffs, great Stanley Cup Finals. Congrats to the league and the Players Association for getting together and getting this done. And a hearty, hearty thank you to the unsung heroes. The broadcasters, some of whom had to spend time in the bubble. The Zamboni drivers. The chefs. The staff that waited on the players when they were in their hotel. The drivers, the arena staff, the people who kept the ice cold. We had hockey in August. We had ice in August. Think about that. We asked a lot of you. As fans, we wanted the NHL back. I was okay with just canceling the season, forget about it. No champions, but once this was announced, we counted on you as fans. The burden that we placed on you was immense, and you hit it out of the park. Whatever credit you get for doing what you did isn't enough. And if I missed anyone, I'm sorry. The list of people is too long to mention off the top of your head. Fantastic job by everyone, really. Alright, now it's time to preview tonight's four MLB games. When one playoffs ends, another one starts. We're going straight from the Stanley Cup playoffs to the MLB playoffs, because that is normal. I'll start with Astros Twins. If the Astros are going to win this game, their hitters have to get back to the level that we all know they can be. Yes, they stole signs. Yes, it was undoubtedly an advantage, but These guys are still really talented. Altuve, Correa, Bregman, Springer, Reddick, Brantley. With the exception of Springer and Brantley, they all underachieved. Correa was okay. He had 264. I mean, that's not bad, but... I expect better from Correa. This is a guy who usually hits 270, 280. And in fact, one year he hit 315. He hits 20 homers. I understand no one was going to hit 20 homers this year, unless your name is Luke Voigt. But, it was still a disappointing year for Correa. Not bad, just disappointing. The Astros hitters need to get their heads screwed on straight if they want to win this series. As for the Twins, this is going to be counterintuitive, but they can't solely rely on the long ball. The Twins hit 91 home runs this year. That's third among all AL teams. I'm not saying take that away, but can you expect 
Granky to give up three or four home runs. Granky's better than that. I'm not even asking for Kenta Maeda to match Zach Granky because that's not going to happen. Yes, Maeda had a better year this year than Granky, but life on the line, I still want Granky pitching more than Maeda. Don't always look to hit the home run here. Don't play hero ball. Just look to put the ball in play, get hits, maybe some walks, however many you can get against Granky. He pitched 67 innings this year, only gave up 9 walks. That's incredible. That's a walk every 7.5 innings, just about. You're not going to hit a bunch of home runs against Granky. You're just not. Be smart. And that's how you'll win this game. Moving on now to White Sox Athletics. And I'm going to be really excited to see what the White Sox's young guns can do. They're starting Lucas Giolito today. He's 25 years old. Nick Madrigal is 23. Tim Anderson is 27. Yoan Moncada, 25. Eloy Jimenez, 23. Luis Robert, 22. Now, Moncada didn't have a good regular season. Robert was okay. He had 11 homers. I don't mind that. But he only hit 233. I don't like that. But the White Sox are a young team. And these guys are going to have to grow up really fast. Now, they have some good veteran leaders on that team. Guys like Jose Abreu, Yasmani Grandal, Edwin Encarnacion, Dallas Keiko, Alex Colome. They don't even need to be particularly good players, and God knows Encarnacion was dreadful this year. He had 157. I don't care if he had 10 home runs. 157. That's atrocious. It's almost as bad as Gary Sanchez. But they'll be able to calm these guys down. With the exception of Abreu, they've all been in the playoffs before. And Abreu did have a successful career in Cuba before he made the jump to the majors. That's going to be the key for the White Sox here. Can their young guns withstand the pressure? As for the athletics, and this is going to sound really cliche, but it's the truth. Because they're not a good offensive team. Their pitching needs to hold. Jesus Luzardo needs to look like the second coming of Catfish Hunter. Liam Hendricks needs to look like the second coming of Raleigh Fingers. J.B. Wendelken is going to come back. He will be available today, so that's a good sign for athletics fans. But at the end of the day, it doesn't mean much if you can't get a lead to him. I think Giolito is going to be able to shut these athletics hitters down The only chance that the Athletics have is their pitching shutting the White Sox down. And that's a tall ask because their hitters are really, really talented. Moving on now to Blue Jays Rays. And the Blue Jays are making a catastrophic mistake here. They're starting Matt Shoemaker against Blake Snell. Hyunjin Ryu is going to start Game 2 against Tyler Glass now. And Taiwan Walker is probably going to go up against Charlie Morton in a possible Game 3. You need to start your ace in Game 1. Can you imagine the Yankees not starting Garrett Cole tonight? Can you imagine the Indians not starting Shane Bieber tonight? Can you imagine the Braves not starting Max Freed tomorrow? This is an incredibly stupid decision. I don't get this. You're forfeiting game one. 
75% of teams that win game one of a best of three series go on to win the whole series. You're immediately putting yourself behind the eight ball here. Matt Shoemaker is not going to be able to match Blake Snell. I mean, all due respect to Shoemaker, he's not a terrible pitcher, but he's not that good either. He's had injury concerns his whole career. He only pitched 28 and two-thirds innings this year. He only started six games. I mean, my God, he's only started 18 games the past three years. That's the guy who you have starting game one? That's a joke. That is an absolute joke. As for the Rays, Blake Snell just needs to pitch like Blake Snell. In fact, he can afford to not be Blake Snell. He can be a little bit worse. I'm not saying don't get out of the first inning and give up five runs, but you don't need to have your ace stuff. You're going up against Matt Shoemaker here. The Rays have this game in the bag. There's no question about that. Moving on now to Yankees-Indians, the game that the entire sports world is going to be watching if they're not watching the presidential debate tonight, or as my mom is calling it, the comedy show. Shane Bieber versus Garrett Cole. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. You have two of the best pitchers in baseball going at it. This is going to be great. Whichever ace pitches better is going to win this game. And whichever team wins tonight is going to win the series. I will say this, though. The Yankees need to execute the fundamentals. Because they've been playing sloppy baseball recently. They haven't been good with runners on base. Forget runners in scoring position, just runners on base. They've been sloppy defensively. Kyle Higashioka was asked to bunt the other day. He popped it straight up and Garrett Cooper made a nice catch. I'm seeing a very disturbing lack of fundamentals with this team. And it scares me going forward. If the Yankees can somehow get past the Indians... I don't see him getting past the Rays. I think their pitching is just too good. Moving on now to the NBA. And a move that was long overdue has finally been consummated. The Clippers and Doc Rivers have mutually parted ways. I don't think Rivers is a bad coach. There are people who hate him more than I do. I don't think he's a great coach. I think he's a little overrated. He's viewed as one of the NBA's elite coaches, and he's not. He hasn't made it out of the second round since 2012. Alright, the 08 Celtics are a distant memory. Pierce, Garnett, Allen, Rondo, forget about it. It's ancient history. What has the guy done recently? He's been the head coach of the Clippers since the 13-14 season. They've never made it out of the second round. And they've had talented rosters. They had Lob City. They were one of the two winners of NBA free agency when they signed Kawhi Leonard and traded for Paul George. The Nets were obviously the other winner. And at the end of the day, you just can't be the coach of the Clippers after you blow a 3-1 series lead to an inferior Nuggets team. All due respect to the Nuggets. I'm not saying they're a bad team, but they're not as good as the Clippers. Okay, the Clippers are the better team. Now, they didn't shoot well. They didn't execute So if you want to tell me that it's unfair to put this all on Doc Rivers, 
I get that. But at the end of the day, someone had to be held accountable for this failure of a season. And I don't think Rivers has shown enough recently to be the head coach of this win-now team going forward. If the Clippers don't win soon, they're not going to win for a long time. It's now or never for them. Almost immediately, Tyron Liu and Jeff Van Gundy were mentioned as the top candidates. Chauncey Billups has also been mentioned. This is easily the most appealing coaching job in the NBA. It's not the Pelicans. It's not the Rockets. It's this Clippers team with an incredibly talented roster. Tyron Liu would make sense. He was an assistant coach for the Clippers this year. Obviously knows the players inside and out. Seems to get along with everyone. That makes sense. Jeff Van Gundy was the guy who I wanted for the Nets. Was a very successful coach. It's been a while since he's coached. And I don't know if he'll ever make that jump from TV to coaching. But this would give him a great opportunity to win an NBA title. Something that he's never done. Chauncey Billups, I don't like that fit. The guy's never coached before. To go from TV to a win-now team, that puts a lot of pressure on him, and it's really risky. I wouldn't advocate for that. I understand he was a former player, was a really, really good point guard, and hey, if Jason Kidd, Derek Fisher, and Steve Nash can make the jump, Why not Chauncey Billups? I get that, but I just think it's a really risky gambit. As for where Rivers will end up next, he'll land on his feet. I don't know if he'll get another head coaching opportunity right away, but look, he's been a good head coach wherever he's been. Not a great one, but a good one. I think the Pelicans make a ton of sense for him. I don't like the fit with the Sixers. I don't think that works. I think that's Mike D'Antoni. I think he's the perfect fit there. Either him or Darvin Ham. The Rockets could maybe work. I could see that. But I don't know how Doc Rivers would like coaching that roster. I understand he used to be a Rocket, and that would be appealing to him, but I'm not crazy about that fit. I don't see that roster working in Doc Rivers' system. I think the best fit for him is either the Pelicans or a lead assistant somewhere. Moving on now to the Indiana Pacers. And it seems like they're in for a tough situation. Victor Oladipo and Miles Turner supposedly want out of Indiana, according to Jared Weiss of The Athletic. I don't begrudge those two guys for wanting to be traded. The Pacers have not been successful recently. Yes, they've made the playoffs a lot, but they haven't made it out of the first round since uh, 2014. And neither one of those guys were around for it. That was a Paul George, David West, and Lance Stevenson team. And Oladipo is going to be a free agent at the end of next season. Now, Turner's under contract for a while through the 2023 season. 
So the Pacers really don't have to trade him, but I don't think Turner fits what they want to do. It seems like they want to roll with a front court of TJ Warren and Domanis Sabonis. I understand you're opening up a hole at the wing if you trade Oladipo and Turner. You move Warren down to the four, Sabonis to the five, who's playing the two and the three. Brogdon's playing the one. But hopefully the return will solve that. Free agency is still a thing. I don't think it's a bad decision for the Pacers to move on from these two guys. Oladipo, definitely, if he's not going to re-sign, then yeah, trade him before he walks and you don't get anything. And Turner, I get, he doesn't fit what the Pacers want to do going forward. So this could be mutually beneficial. The Pacers get to move on with a roster that fits their vision more, and Oladipo and Turner can go into winning situations. I will say this. There was a rumor, nothing serious, just people speculating on Twitter, that Oladipo could go to the Nets for Karis LeVert. I would do that trade in a heartbeat as a Nets fan. Oladipo fits what the Nets need. He's a perfect third banana, great defensively, led the NBA in steals in 17-18, really good scorer, really good penetrator, can drive and dish, Turner can fit with the Nets too. If the Nets want to expand the trade, he could start at center. He could start at power forward. He does have that floor-stretching ability. Or it's possible that he could come off the bench. Now, he would have to buy into that. But how does a bench of Spencer Dinwiddie, Miles Turner, and blank sound? I don't care what that blank is. That's fantastic. I mean, I'll tell you, a trade of Levert, Prince, Allen, Musa, and Kuruks for Oladipo and Turner works under the CBA. So if the Nets are serious about adding a third star, and I think they should, I don't think it's Levert. I don't think it's Jordan. Victor Oladipo would be a perfect fit. And if you add Miles Turner too, that's the icing on the cake. All right, I'm going to close this show out with eulogizing Jay Johnstone. Now, I'm not going to go year by year through his career. That's not the right way to talk about him. Instead, I want to talk about two playoff series where John Stone played an integral role. The 1976 NLCS and the 1981 World Series. And then I'll get into his extracurricular stuff because... That's where it really gets fun. In 76, John Stone had already turned his career around. He had bounced around a few teams, never really did much, struggled to find a place in the majors. In 74, the Phillies took a shot on him, and it paid off. He played well in part-time duty that year. 75, he was the primary starting right fielder for the Phillies. And then in 76, once again, he was the primary starting right fielder. The Phillies went on to face the Reds 
in the NLCS that year. John Stone had a great series. He hit 778. He was 7 for 9. Unfortunately for him, the Reds just feasted on Philly's pitching. Pete Rose was great that series, so was Ken Griffey Sr., so was Johnny Bench. George Foster hit a couple big home runs. The Reds were the better team. They were defending their World Series. They would win the World Series that year. Yes, they did win back-to-back. And then the Yankees would win back-to-back. But it set the stage for what John Stone did in 81. By then, John Stone was an L.A. Dodger. Now, he wasn't starting or anything, but he still had a role on the team. Tommy Lasorda liked using him as a pinch hitter. Now, John Stone wasn't great in that role. In the regular season, he hit 205 with just three homers and six RBIs in 83 at-bats. I mean, that's not good. But you know what? All those bad feelings that Dodgers fans may have had towards John Stone for not contributing during the regular season were negated in Game 4 of the 81 World Series. The Yankees were going up against the Dodgers. It's 6-3 Yankees at this point. The Yankees are up 2-1 in the series. A win here, and the Yankees most likely win the whole thing. It's the bottom of the sixth. Ron Davis, former Yankees pitcher, father of Ike Davis, gets Pedro Guerrero to fly out to the center fielder, uh, Bobby Brown. Mike Sosha draws a walk. John Stone comes in as a pinch hitter for Dodgers pitcher Tom Nienenfuehrer. On a 1-2 pitch, John Stone hits a home run to make it 6-5 Yankees. Right there, the whole series changed. Davis fell apart. He allowed the tying run to score with some help from Reggie Jackson in the outfield. Tommy John, in relief of George Frazier, did not pitch well. The Dodgers went on to win 8-7, and they would win the World Series four days later. The entire tone of that World Series changed after John Stone hit that pinch hit home run. If that doesn't happen, the Yankees win the 81 World Series. It's just that simple. There's no debating that. But that's not how most people remember John Stone. They may remember him as a broadcaster. He did call Yankees games and Phillies games for a couple seasons. And he wasn't bad. But more than anything, he's remembered as a prankster. I mean, I'll read you some of the pranks that are listed on Wikipedia. This isn't an exhaustive list or anything. But this is a good indicator of the kind of clown that John Stone was. And I mean that in the nicest way possible. He once placed a wet brownie inside Steve Garvey's first base glove. He'd hot-foot his teammates. He cut up the underwear of Rick Sutcliffe. He locked Tommy Lasorda in his office once. Him and Jerry Royce once dressed up as groundskeepers to help 
manicure the infield. Lasorda didn't like that, but John Stone hit a pinch hit home run. So, not much Lasorda could do. That part I didn't know, so thank you, Wikipedia. He'd nail people's cleats to the floor. He'd replace the pictures in Lasorda's office with pictures of himself and a couple other Dodgers. One time during warm-ups, he walked through Dodger Stadium to get a hot dog. One time he was taking a taxi to the game. The taxi was stuck in traffic, so John Stone in full uniform sprinted towards Dodger Stadium. And it didn't stop there. One time as a broadcaster, he covered the microphone with the scent of stale eggs and then interviewed a few players. That I didn't know. So thank you, Wikipedia. I love Wikipedia. One time as a Yankees announcer... He faked a pause for a commercial, and he pulled out a bread basket for Deion Sanders and Mel Hall when they took the cover off the basket. There was a snake inside, and Sanders and Hall nearly jumped out of their shoes. He was just one of those guys. He was a character. Yeah. Not the greatest hitter in the world. Had a few seasons where he played really well, but more than anything, he just remembered as a goofball. And there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes you need a guy like that to keep everyone loose, keep everyone on their toes, help people not take themselves too seriously, and his death was announced yesterday. He actually died on Saturday at the age of 74 from dementia and the coronavirus. May he rest in peace. Early show tomorrow. You're going to get it at noon. The MLB playoffs are starting at noon, so it's a noon show. Until tomorrow, I am Jacob Valk saying that I think I get more upset when I lose a fish than when I lose a baseball game. In baseball, there's always another game. There's another chance to be a hero. That's not true when you lose a big fish.